morning again, everyone. So we're going to resume our session with uh, somebody who scarcely needs any uh, introduction. Um, he's the music director of the Sydney Symphony, he used to be the music director of the St. Louis Symphony. He teaches conducting at Juilliard School of Music and um, used to um, conduct the Ensemble Intercontemporain for many years. Uh, he, one of his pet subjects is programming and uh, so we're very excited to have him this morning talk to us uh, and share his ideas about programming. Please give a, give a warm welcome to David Robertson. Thank you very much. Can everybody hear him? Yes. Good. All right. So I have a couple of questions. The first question is, who has made programs that they are happy with? Great. Who has made programs they are unhappy with? Right. So I'm sure you have thought about a lot of the same thing. And I thought what I would hear is give you some of my personal ideas that help me to craft programs. First of all, and this is for those of you taking notes, the subject is so huge and the repertoire we have to choose from if we only take the last 300 years of music is so enormous that you have to have some guiding principles, otherwise you go crazy. So I'd like to talk about four basic ideas, um, and I'll talk about them in this order, although their importance is interconnected, so separating them out is already hard. The first one I will call an artistic reason. So an artistic reason seems self-evident, but sometimes it can get lost. So that's why I put it at number one. Number two is that every program, I think, has to have at least one anchor. So one thing, or possibly two things, maybe even three, that are really unmovable, solid things. Then three, which follows on from what you have as building that program around that anchor has to do with the proportional structure. And this also has concepts like how the program flows and how it, it moves from one piece to the next or doesn't move from one piece to the next. And then finally, a word which is a little crazy, but I like it very much, which is the quiddity. And that's really the essence. The quiddity is the nature or essence of a thing. And so this is really the sort of, why does your program exist? What is it? And that circles back, of course, to the first part, which is the artistic reason. So if we get started with this sort of thing, I think that you need to have an actual artistic ideal. If you don't have the artistic ideal without that, when you start to enter into discussions with other people, with other partners that you're putting on the concert with, and they may be um, the venue where you're giving the concert, they may be, if, if you are an invited guest conductor, they may be the orchestra that is inviting you and the other things they may have in the rest of their season. If it happens to be your own orchestra, at a certain point, the marketing people are going to come knocking on your door and saying, what are you doing with this? And that's where the actual artistic ideal really has to be clear in your mind. Because if you don't have that, it will start getting a little bit foggy or a little bit confusing when all of a sudden somebody says, oh, well, maybe we could just change this or maybe we can change that. And you sort of, you keep saying, yes, that sounds good. Okay, yes, we can shift that. And if this artistic ideal that you have at the basis of your program is not really clear to you, it will become less and less clear to others when you're trying to communicate. 
So it, in the end, that's why I think usually the people who raise their hands and say, yes, I made a program I was unhappy with is probably the reason why that program felt somehow wrong. So going on to... And he, he Sorry, David. In. Sorry, David. We lost you for a second there. The, the image was. Right. If you can just go back maybe a sentence or two. <laughs> okay. So you definitely need an anchor of some sort. And an anchor is a main piece that you can attach all of the rest of the pieces in the program to. It may be more than one piece. You may, it may be a combination of two pieces that will not change. It also may be that the anchor is the longest piece on the program, which quite often is the way to think of it, but it could also be the concerto. If the soloist is a major component of the program, um, let's say you have Anne-Sophie Mutter or Lang Lang, they are going to be the main driver of the program. Even if you make an artistic program around them, that piece will be the anchor. If it's the Tchaikovsky Violin Concerto or the Beethoven Violin Concerto or the Tchaikovsky First Piano Concerto, these are the works that will actually be the anchor. They will be unchanged. Once you have that anchor, thinking really deeply about the connections that are possible from that anchor. So where you could attach it, attach it here, or attach it there, what kinds of possibilities that anchor gives you is one of the main things to be thinking about. Then we get to the question of proportions in a program, how we actually put other pieces together with that anchor. And in this, I think it's sometimes helpful to go outside of our musical ideas and look at other situations where collections or groups of things have been put together. So for example, we can then take a lesson from say, a collection of paintings. In galleries very often, in museums, you will have one room with possibly four walls or three walls and the curator of the museum has put three, four, five paintings in that space. And the, these paintings will all of a sudden begin to talk to each other and they will begin to influence each other. The same thing when you see a collection of poems in a book or in a small pamphlet or a collection of short stories. Each one of those stories, when you, when you have read it, or the poem, when you have gone through it, will have an influence on the next one that you read. And so this sense of being aware of what others have done in other contexts helps us sometimes to get out of a creative rut. I find the most helpful collections are actually the ones for us that are also dealing with time's error. The way that time is moving in a concert is essential for the audience. And that helps very much, for example, to look at a program of dance. How are the pieces put together on that? Or perhaps even further away from what we think of as performance. And my favorite one to research is a tasting menu at a restaurant. This allows you both to eat nice food while you are thinking but also to be looking at how a chef has decided to put each element in balance and proportion with what came before and what will come afterwards. So this means that all of these different sort of ideas, the question of progression, the question of contrast, the question of order, and the question of balance, these have to be correctly judged for a program to make sense to an audience beyond each piece being good in and of itself. So this then 
you know, lead, brings me to the really tricky moment, the moment of um, greatest uh, importance, I would say, for us living now in 2020. And that is in the era of Apple Music and Spotify and Rhapsody and YouTube, why should somebody come to your concert? Why should they take the time and effort, not to mention the financial questions and the transport and making a special uh, outing to come to your concert hall? Why should they come and listen to this? And the point of this whole discussion is that for me, when someone asks that question, there may be love reasons. But from the point of view of the conductor in an orchestra or the programmer in any situation, our main response to why should I come and listen to your concert has to be the program. And then this leads me to that final question of the quiddity or the essence or nature of the actual thing of a program. The challenge of putting these pieces together makes the concert, when you ask why should someone come to it, feel like an existential question. Why should a concert exist? And any time in my experience, maybe because I spent a long time in France, that you ask existential questions, it starts getting depressing. It doesn't do that on purpose, but it sort of feels like, well, I've heard so much about the death of classical music which has been really well publicized, that maybe my program is just end of life care and I'm really just directing a hospice and soon everybody dies and there are no more concerts. I think this is nonsense because in effect, the this is a worry that people have been having for ages, probably since the Greeks and maybe even earlier since the Persians. Anytime you get something that is new and a special change, it will affect other things coming afterwards. This was when they said, yes, the moment that we have written words, all of a sudden people's memories are just going to go out the window. So when painting came in, in the 19th century, when photo photography came in, pardon me, in the 19th century, everyone said, this will be the end of painting. And then when movies and cinema came in, people said, ah, this will be the end of theater. And then when television came along, this meant it will be the end of theater and movies. Obviously, these things are not true. What we do see is that in a sort of Venn diagram-like way, the two circles, if we take photography and painting, there's a place where they overlap, where they are both dealing with images. If we take movies and theater, they are both talking about how we tell a story, where we watch people or we watch situations in which that story is being acted out. But at the same time, the really important aspect of this, which can be lost sight of very easily because one is worried, is that when you look at a painting or a photograph or a film or a television show or a piece of theater, there are some things that each one can do that the others cannot. And this is probably the most important thing to really stress. There are certain elements in any expressive medium that that medium uniquely is capable of bringing across and communicating. So in the end, when we get to this existential question of why you should go to a concert and what is the use and what can we do this quiddity, this essence of our program has to be that our concert program is expressing things in such a way that it cannot be replaced by anything else. 
And if you have done your program with this kind of thought behind it, even going on YouTube and watching the pieces in your program does not replace the feeling of the audience in one particular acoustic with one set of, of musicians hearing the trajectory and experiencing the trajectory and what the pieces on your program says to them. And when you have been in a concert like this, the idea of saying, oh, well, I can just listen to those pieces on Spotify becomes absurd. And you realize that certain things are just not going to be expressed otherwise. And this, we can get into the details of this and we'll talk about some specific programming. But one thing that you notice, and I'm sure you have noticed it before when you've been conducting, if you put three pieces together on a program, while you are rehearsing those three pieces, the interaction between those pieces within the same rehearsal time is subtly influencing how your musicians play. If you are playing works that are on, from the 20th century connected with the 18th century, your musicians will play the works of the 18th century differently, and they will also listen to the 20th century works differently. So that's the sort of thing that the audience might not necessarily realize, but we start to feel this and we can feel the cross fertilization of each one of the pieces with our musicians and by extension, the way the audience feels it. So before I get to the programs, I just like to give some sort of ideas of why I think this way and why I am passionate about putting programs together. For me, I like to think of a program as a unique, unrepeatable event. So yes, there may be repeat performances. You may play a, a single concert program once, three times, four times, possibly even on tour. But the pieces themselves, the musicians who are playing, the soloists or soloists that are involved, the venue and the audience make up something that when taken together is unique and really only happens in that one time. And I like to think of it this way because then I know that I'm always making it fresh. I'm always making a program fresh. And that way I'm really interested in, in the uniqueness of this particular combination at this particular moment and time. So this also not only helps me get excited about the program, because I know this is my one chance to really connect these things together, and I have not connected them together before, but it also means when I'm working on a program this way, I can dispel that very confusing feeling when you're talking to an artistic administrator and they say, so David, what would you like to do 20 months from now? I have no idea who I'm going to be 20 months from now. Theoretically, I will have the same driver's license and passport um, and probably the same tax authorities looking at me. But that part is not the part that is involved in really wanting on a date a year and a half away from this conversation, wanting passionately to perform a particular group of works. And so having that sense of these works, I've never done them together before, gives me a kind of exciting goal to look forward to. So my personal background in making programs is the result of a happy career accident. I was not expecting at all to be made the music director of the Ensemble Intercontemporain. I had worked with a number of orchestras and opera companies before, but this was my first real moment where I was responsible for the entire program. What I did, what guest conductors did, even what kinds of chamber music concerts or 
other events we might do around our season. And I quickly learned in a group that was dedicated to the 20th and 21st centuries exclusively that I couldn't go to the big repertoire cupboard where all of the great wonders of the past are and just pick out a couple of things to make a standard orchestral program of overture concerto symphony. There, I've made my meal and it's kind of standard, but it will work and everyone will be happy. You just can't do that. The pieces don't exist. There are some pieces which may be stronger, but what it forces you to do is think about every single possible connection that a piece or a couple of pieces might have. And through those connections, you can start to build something that has a coherence and makes sense as a proposition before the public. I feel this, this is very, very important because in the end, what you are trying to do, Pace Rousseau, is to have a social contract with your audience so that they look at you and say, you have an expert's knowledge, a specialization, specialization of knowledge about a whole field of repertoire. And so we trust you in choosing these particular works to put something together which is challenging, enlightening, interesting, and will change the way we look at things, that we won't come out of this concert feeling the same way that we were when we went in. So I'm personally forever grateful to my experience at the Ensemble Intercontemporain, although learning this discipline was very hard. I had made programs before, and it was very easy to say, oh, sure, let's just do that Beethoven symphony. Sure, let's just do that concerto. And all of a sudden, when that wasn't there, when this safety net of standard repertoire was taken away, it made me look at why I am pro proposing these particular pieces in any one given concert. And that's a discipline which I have found tremendously helpful when you come back into a repertoire where you have 300 years of music to choose from, because you no longer take for granted a work that is a masterpiece, but can too easily be taken as the easiest choice. Oh, let's just do Dvorak's Ninth Symphony. It's a great piece of music, but it feels less than great if that is how it is used by you as a programmer and by your organization in marketing terms. So you probably have questions, but I think given the, the tenuous nature of my Skype connection, I will ask you to hold them for later. And now I will give you some idea of how I put those general concepts into specific program ideas. Let me ask again with a show of hands, how many of you have been asked to make an all Beethoven program? Okay, a couple. How many have been asked to do an all one composer program? More. So people love this. They say, can you do an all Mozart program, an all Tchaikovsky program, an all Dvorak program, an all Brahms program? You get the idea. It is so usually someone in the organization, marketing director, PR person, board chair can say, look, and then, you know, get a megaphone. We're doing all fill in the blank. I find that unfortunate because the repertoire is larger than this. I think personally that a concert which has all six Brandenburg concertos has been heavily influenced by the recording industry because when I was growing up, and it's a little different now, when you went in to buy a recording, you would buy a recording of all something, all the Brandenburg concertos, all the Vivaldi Four Seasons. 
I don't know that you have to do all four seasons on one concert. It used to be that you could get a pianist who would do a disc of pieces like they would do in a recital, where all the pieces were interesting. That happens less now in recordings. This is also a completely changing situation in the age of Spotify and Apple Music and Rhapsody, which have playlists. So all of a sudden, these things are changing again, and we react to that. But I think the algorithms we have to come up with are somewhat different. When I was asked to do an all Beethoven concert once, I gave in because the marketing people wanted Leonora number three, a very nice piano soloist doing the third piano concerto of Beethoven, and then Beethoven's third symphony. You see, they're all connected with the number three. Even preschoolers get this. <laughs> they're all nice pieces. But a couple of seasons later, when I was asked again, could you do an all Beethoven program? I said, sure. And I came up with a program where the anchor was Beethoven's Mass in C. And we had a wonderful chorus in St. Louis, and I was able to use soloists from the chorus so that it would be more like the liturgical performance of the time. So rather than big name soloists for this, people who step out of the choir and sing the solo parts. I started the concert with a piece that I think no one in the audience and even some people in the orchestra did not know existed. The three equali of Beethoven for four trombones. This meant that the liturgical aspect of the Mass in C was already set up by the liturgical nature of the four trombones playing as a choir. It was a surprising open opening to the start. And I followed that on the first half with the orchestra playing Beethoven's Eighth Symphony. Beethoven's Eighth does not get performed very often because it doesn't end as large, both for the conductor and the audience and the orchestra as seven, five, and three. And so here's this great piece of music that is underplayed and is a very nice contrast from Beethoven showing in around the same time, a little bit later, but close enough in the middle period to the mass in C that we can see just how varied Beethoven can be with orchestra and voices. And so that was my all Beethoven program. I felt that showed the audience something that was worth having an all Beethoven program. Now, sometimes you won't necessarily want all one composer, but I'll give you a couple. Let's say you have a famous soloist coming in. You might have, as I already mentioned, Anne-Sophie Mutter. She came to Sydney and she wanted to do the Tchaikovsky Violin Concerto. It is clear in this case you should end with the Tchaikovsky concert. Because if people are coming for Anne Sophie Mutter and you have something after the break, you will have half the audience. They will all want to be sort of leaving and having dinner. So use the, the opportunity to play something that they don't know exists. They are going to be there anyway. I think many people who go to a concert are afraid to hear something new. They've had a bad experience. It's like going to a restaurant and in the tasting menu is something they really dislike. And the chef says, no substitution, only this. So they don't like to listen to something they don't know. In German, one has the saying, was der Bauer nicht kennt, das ist er nicht. What the farmer doesn't know, he's not going to eat, which is understandable. His food comes from the land. Something is flown in from another country. He's going to be a little bit wary. So in this case, Tchaikovsky Violin Concerto, Russian Romantic. First half, Kalinikov First Symphony. 
Many people in the audience have never heard of Kalinikov. Some of them think it sounds like a Russian machine gun. So already they're worried. And you need to say, this piece was written a little bit after the Tchaikovsky Violin Concerto, and you will enjoy it. The experience is twofold. One, this little known piece, which I think is wonderful, is played, giving the orchestra something interesting to, and challenging to do on a concert where they're playing the Tchaikovsky Violin Concerto, which from the orchestra's point of view, perhaps not as satisfying as playing a major piece for them. Then the audience gets the feeling of, look how nice it is that I heard a piece for almost half an hour, a little bit more, and I actually really enjoyed it. And then they get a very nice feeling at the end from the concerto with Anne-Sophie. But you don't necessarily need to go in that direction. Radio France asked for a concert, and all I knew was that they had my friend Kirill Gerstein on piano, and they wanted him to play Paganini variations of Rachmaninoff. So I thought, okay, it's the radio. We will probably have a more interesting audience and they won't be the standard group. It was not at Théâtre des Champs-Élysées. It was not at Playel. It was not at the new concert hall in the Philharmonie. So there you also think about the venue. And I thought the nature of variations, the nature of taking violin variations and putting them on piano, the various other composers before who have taken Paganini's variations from the Caprice and made it for piano like Brahms with the left hand. And I thought, why don't we take pieces that started out in piano and became pieces for orchestra? Because that also shows a different side of variation than just standard variation form. When you take a piece and enlarge it, it is also another kind of variation, not necessarily on the X axis, but on the Y axis. So here I started the program with Boulez notation, the five not notations that exist, one, seven, four, three, and two. But the difference was here, as I had Kirill Gerstein, who plays contemporary music wonderfully, I had him play the small pieces that Boulez wrote in the 1940s on the piano, followed then by the orchestra playing the complete ex expansion of the work for orchestra. Then after the intermission, we had Benjamin's, uh, George Benjamin's piece, Dance Figures, which started out as a piece for piano that he then en en enlarged for the orchestra in the same way before the Rachmaninoff. So that there was this constant sense of the piano being present the whole time by the time we then got to the Rachmaninoff. And of course, as the Rachmaninoff was such a success, I knew that Kirill would play an encore, which allowed him then to focus back on the piano by itself to finish the concert. A couple of others where modern works can contrast with works from the past. I had once um, Tchaikovsky's Sixth Symphony, and I was asked to put it together with something. And I thought, okay, let's try and look at some various elements of energy, as well as the, I would say the sense of space that the pathetic has between the space of a waltz that's in five, four, or the space of the slow introduction, or the sense of coalescing and then coming apart that we have in the last movement, and the sense of absolute direction going the whole time in the third movement. I put it together with Thomas Addis's Violin Concerto, Concentric Paths, which has a sort of motor perpetual first movement, has the large passacaglia um, of the variations in the second movement, and then the third movement 
almost has a kind of bluesy, um, almost folk song type of idea. And I opened the program with Vaughn Williams' Talus Fantasy. Now, the interesting thing there is that the Talus is looking at music from the past in a more modern sense. The Violin Concerto of Addis is looking at music from the past in its second movement with the Passacaglia, clearly referring to violin concertos from the Baroque period, and notably something like the Bach Chacon. And then the Tchaikovsky, we know that Tchaikovsky was fascinated with Mozart and loved Mozart. And so there are elements of classicism even within this romanticism. Now, I think this program fits beautifully, but if you know the second movement of the Addis, there is a moment where the orchestra spreads out and is very slow and the audience retroactively, so in the Addis, understands something about the sound world of the Vaughan Williams with the strings that they can't get from the Vaughan Williams by itself. And so this for me is how the pieces in the program, even with an intermission, talk to each other on either side. Now, sometimes you will have another big war horse and you are asked to, perf to make a program around it. So for example, with Mozart's Requiem, that is a main work. And in fact, marketing can say Mozart Requiem and pretty much everyone will come. So how do you take the Mozart Requiem, which is not a whole evening, and allow it to become more than just a cliche? There are lots of different ways of doing this. And I'll give you a few examples that I have used. When I was thinking about the, the Requiem, the question came, this was just after um, Robert Levin, Bob Levin, had made his version. And so the first question that came from the orchestra was, which version do you want? And I thought, there are interesting things in Bob Levin's version, and it is worth studying and worth performing. But I find something very touching about the Sussmeyer. And part of why I find the Sussmeyer completion so touching is the story behind the completion where Constanza needed the piece finished in order to get the money from the commission. And she really needed money at this point. So she first gave it not to Susmeyer, but to Esla. And we have his attempts printed in the Neue Mozart Ausgabe, in the new edition of Mozart. And it's very touching because you can see how much Mozart had written and what was not there. And for Esla, there was a certain point at which he said, I can't do this. And Susmeyer probably also felt the same thing. But somehow he said, I understand and know enough of what the master told me that I think I would do this. And I think he would say it's okay. So there's this, for me in the Mozart Requiem, in the Sussmeyer version, not only the beautiful music of Mozart, but an incredible love on behalf of the student for the master who's departed. And that made me think of Josquin de Pré, because Josquin de Pré studied, as did almost everyone in the sort of Flemish period, the high period of music for Flanders with the polyphony and the incredible things they were able to do. They all studied with Ockeghem. And so when Ockeghem died, Josquin wrote a piece called Naf de Bois. And Naf de Bois has a text which laments the death of Ockeghem quotes the names of some of Ockeghem's famous students and has an actual cantus firmus in it, like a, the type of exercise that Ockeghem would have given to the students. Then I thought of 
Kurtag's Stelle. In English, the name for a tombstone is often called a funeral stele, and it, this is the word stele from the Greek. What that gives us in the case of Kurtag is a memorial piece, the last movement of which actually literally uses the rhythm of the name of one of his friends recently departed, a man with whom I was fortunate to take some private lessons, the Hungarian cellist, conductor, and composer, Mihai Andrash, or Andrash Mihai. And you hear this in the orchestra's repeating very softly of a five note figure where the actual accentuation of the name, Mihai Andrash, is a constant lament keening through this final movement. So starting with the piece that was a little bit over 300 years old, and then a piece when we first played this that was only about 10 years old, and then going back to the Mozart, had three pieces, all of which were showing that when someone passes, what a composer does is to express their depth of sorrow and consolation through music. Now, this program was so successful with some people who check out what conductors are doing on the internet that the BBC asked me to do it again. I don't like to do programs again, but this program really was very special. I don't know how many of you know the stage at the Barbican Theatre in London, but it is not very big. And we soon saw that the Kurtag just would not fit. So I thought, ah, well, maybe I have to change the whole program. But the BBC Symphony Chorus is wonderful, and I wanted to keep the a cappella work on the program. So I thought, wait a minute. Pierre Boulez wrote In, Mem in Memoriam of Bruno Maderna, in the same way, Moderna, the conductor and composer, died quite suddenly from a very aggressive cancer. This was Pierre's response to that death. And so there we did the Josquin, the Boulez, and then the, the Mozart. And here's where you can see that one anchor, and in fact, the other anchor, having the Josquin and the, the Mozart, allowed us to find a very suitable, and in certain ways, brilliant solution to not being able to do one of the pieces. I was asked again in St. Louis later to do the Mozart Requiem, and obviously I couldn't do the same thing. But so I thought Requiems also are very much about grounding. Something like the Brahms Deutsches Requiem is not so much for the people who have departed, they're either in heaven or in hell or just dust, depending on your personal spiritual viewpoint. But for those who remain, the requiem is a consolation. And so I use that to ground the piece that John Adams wrote for 9-11 on the transmigration of souls. The transmigration of souls has in it a moment where we hear quotes quite literally, and also in certain fragmented ways from Ives' unanswered question. And I've always felt when I heard this, that knowing the unanswered question by heart, I hear them. But I think most audience members are not so familiar with the Ives' work. So what I did was to put the Ives' unanswered question on the first part of the program, followed by the Adams, and because the Ives finishes very softly with the chords representing the Druids or the people who are not thinking about things, and the Adam starts with the sound of the city before the music begins and the people's voices missing, missing, and the footsteps and the cars moving in the background, I dovetailed the two and so went without a break right into the atoms. 
and I gave the sound designer the cue at the end of the Adams, just after the trumpet has given the final question, which remains unanswered, the cue to start the Adams, which in a certain way then ends up being the answer. The Adams is an answer about light, but the thing about this light is that it is, it is one that we hope for, but the evidence of it is not seen. And then the Mozart in the second half can ground. So in this way, you take a piece that you have done before and that the orchestra has done before, and you look at it in a different, in a different line. I would have to say that in the rehearsal period, when you have the atoms with the sense of tremendous loss that is involved in something as brutal and sudden as the 9-11 attacks were. When you get to the DS era, you don't have to ask the orchestra to play fortissimo. It happens all by itself because of the other works on the program. So just a couple of other little ones. I don't want to take all your time. You have a busy day ahead of you. I don't know about you, but I've always felt that if you put Dvorak 7 at the end of a program, somehow it doesn't really excite the audience. And I compare this, probably unfortunately, to the Eighth Symphony and the Ninth Symphony, which have the audience on their feet immediately. It's not that I don't love Dvorak 7, I think it's fabulous, but I have noted that it is very hard unless you distort the ending to really get the audience as excited about it as they should. So I had the opportunity to try out a program once that I liked very much and seemed to really connect with the audience. We had Christine Brewer to sing the four last songs of Strauss. And while these are very autumnal songs, at the same time, the interesting thing about them is that they have rather strange atmospheres. So in the Demrigen Grüften at the very beginning of the song, where these dark valleys, where one was dreaming for a long time, or the sense of the September rain that sinks in the, in the cool on the dying flowers, all of these things go together. And so I combined a program where the first half was Dvorak 7. And of course, Dvorak talked about the darkness of his opening theme being a result of seeing people who were being persecuted in Hungary coming up and arriving at the train station here in Prague at the main station and getting off and very dark at night and it was somber and everyone was very serious because of these political events. And so after the intermission, after the Dvorak, we played George Crumb's A Haunted Landscape. And the haunted landscape of Crumb is very eerie, partly because two solo basses play a low B flat, so lower even than the five string, string basses, normal low B natural. This went on for the entire piece. So it gives this rather strange atmosphere and set up the Strauss in a way where the almost uniqueness of being alive, which the Strauss is contemplating at the end of life, came to the fore. The people who did not know the work of George Crow were suddenly delighted to find that this work seemed to make sense within that context. And so, and so that's the way for me that you can create something where the audience begins to feel we can trust this person if there's something unfamiliar on the pro program, that our time is well spent listening to it. Is there one other? I can give you one other program and then I will ask for any questions or you can say, that's enough. We don't want to hear anymore. I was asked to do Beethoven V, and I was doing Beethoven V in a whole series of concerts in France, where in my orchestra in Lyon, 
we were looking at how the Beethoven symphonies really changed music. Orchestras were formed in order to play the Beethoven symphonies. They were a major changing point in the idea of a classical repertoire that is the bedrock and that we play over and over again, as I'm sure you are thinking about in this year of 2020. So when we got to the fifth, I thought, well, it's true. It is the most radical of any symphonic utterance, so much so that at that first rehearsal, everyone thought the first movement was a joke because the theme was so short. So I thought, well, what other radical pieces are there? And I thought, well, in the 20th, early 20th century, paralleling the early 19th century, there's Schoenberg's Erwartung. That work pushes eternality as far as you can go. And in fact, from that point on, you can almost see Schoenberg going, maybe I've gone a little bit too far, let's pull back here. And then I thought, well, if you just start with Erwartung, it doesn't, it doesn't really work. And it comes out of Wagner. And of course, the Tristan chord was revolutionary to people because although it's a minor seven flat five, it's a common chord that's used all the time. It was the fact that it never resolved in quite the same way or that it could be used to show a lack of resolution that was a perfect parallel for the Tristan and Isolde story. That was what got me. So in fact, the program ended up being the Tristan prelude. And just at the moment where normally in the prelude and Liebestod concert version, the soloist would come out, the solo singer entered onto the stage. And instead of then making the unkindest cut of all in the opera and going from the setup of uh, the dominant to Westwärts, Schreibt der Wind, Ostwärts schreibt das Schiff, we got the beginning of Erwartung, blended one right into the other. And that program was extremely satisfying because when we got to the end of the Beethoven, which hammers out tonic and dominant chords in C major, like it, they're just never going to stop. Having a first half that was all about lack of stability felt like the proper preparation for this amount of almost overstability that we have at the end of the fifth symphony. And so that was one which I ended up doing a number of times again, just because it was, it was so satisfying for me and then for the orchestras that did it afterwards. So that's pretty much all I have to say. I, you may have some questions and I'm happy to take them. Uh, we'll see if, if the gods of the internet still work with us. So we have time for about one, maybe two questions, if anybody. Anybody has questions? We have time for maybe one or two. Yes. For tonality, do you think um, is there any experience that a programming really doesn't work because of a poor choice of tonality linkage or reference? So, is there any um, moment where you feel a program might not work be because of a poor choice of tonality linkage? Different. Yes. Choices. I think one needs to. Be of tonality uh, also of needs to be a, of keys yeah uh, the keys but also things like what's the size of one orchestra by comparison to the next putting a big loud modern piece before a mozart concerto will be hard for the players but also then has a sense of size where the audience has difficulty finding the right proportions. Or when you put a program together, does something end softly? If it ends softly, does that work well with the beginning of the next piece? And I think these kinds of connections are an example. I once in an all-American program with St. Louis, we had the the Copeland um, Lincoln portrait. 
And it starts at the beginning quite softly. So you don't want to have something that is brash beforehand. And I use the unanswered question because the unanswered question in its original form is a trumpet asks a question, four flutes answer. That means that the four flutes and the trumpet never play together. This is very similar to what happened in the Civil War. What are the first two instruments that Copeland puts together? Trumpet and flute. And so already just in the connection and then going from the G major of that into the Copeland sense of tonality made such great sense also in the, in the connection of, wait a minute, this is about a union and having those things together. So those kinds of things really should also be part of your, your ideas when, when you're looking at all of the various different possible connections or correspondences or similarities in pieces. Thank you so much. I'm afraid we're out of time. David, thank you so much for being with us today. I think we could have kept going for a couple hours still. Thank you so much for your, your thoughtful reflections on programming. I'm sure everybody joins me in, in, in thanking you. It's giving a, given us a lot of, to think about. Good luck with the performances in Prague this week. Thank you.